Yeah, in a funny kind of way, it's odd for an Australian songwriter to be writing these kinds of songs, I guess. Um, but I think that the, the truth is that many of the American musical stylings of the 20th century are just so sublime that they've become universal. I mean, uh, we play rock and roll here in Australia, we play bluegrass. The, 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 the American exports, the cultural exports from the last century were just so beautiful. We're just so beautiful that we've pretty much adopted them, and, uh, as well as the American stories that went with them. We, we know the Dust Bowl story here in Australia, uh, uh, although it was beautiful to have it teased out in greater detail there. Um, and there is something universal about it. Uh, I think there is something universal in bluegrass, <coughs> sort of humility in the face of life's challenges which is the essential quality of bluegrass, which has made it universal. I mean, bluegrass in particular is said to be very popular in four countries. The United States, obviously, Australia, Japan, <laughs> and Czechoslovakia. There's <laughs> <laughs> a huge bluegrass scene in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Apparently. Which brings me to a topic very dear to my heart which is the nexus between bluegrass and foreign policy. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't leave, this will be fascinating. <laughs> one, of the, one of the perennial tensions in American politics, which I mentioned earlier, is that between internationalism and isolationism. At the beginning of the 20th century, isolationism was in vogue. Um, but, of course, the Americans eventually were dragged out of glorious isolationism by what they ended up perceiving to be the demands of the First World War, where they covered themselves in glory, pretty much saving Western Europe. And then they did it again in the Second World War, with heroic landings along the French coast at places like Normandy, led by venerable and mature generals like Eisenhower and George C. Marshall. They saved Western Europe. And having done so, rather than put America first, they went for a win-win solution called the Marshall Plan. They rebuilt the European economy, figuring that they'd benefit from that and the Western Europeans would benefit from that and would form a bulwark against communism. And pretty much it worked. And they underwrote the Bretton Woods system of international finances and free trade, which has seen an unprecedented period of peace and prosperity for the last 75 years. As far as hegemons go, the Americans have been pretty good. It's not to say they've been perfect, and again, it's their predilection to belief, optimism, that gets them into trouble. Belief in the domino theory got them into misadventures at Vietnam, and we followed them in, of course. Belief in the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq got them involved in that misadventure, and again we followed them in. <coughs> Afghanistan, slightly different story. The Americans were actually engaged there right through the 1950s. There's a photograph of Eisenhower in the city of Kabul. They were competing for influence in Afghanistan with the Russians. The Americans were generally dominant in the south of the country the Russians dominant in the north. And in the south, the American government sponsored huge infrastructure projects, particularly in a province called Helmand, which became known as Little America in Afghanistan. And following on the successes of the WPA of the 1930s, they believed in infrastructure and they built a huge dam at a village on the Helmand River called Kajaki. The purposes of the Kajaki Dam were firstly to provide electricity and secondly irrigation to the Helmand River Valley. The irrigation part kind of worked out and Helmand Province went on to provide 40% of the world's opium. <laughs> In the military they call it second order effects. It can be hard to predict. Anyway, the dam was pretty functional. And when the Taliban took over, they had a profoundly anti-modernist approach to economic map policy, and they ran the dam into the ground. And so when ISAF, the 
the International Security Assistance Force took over Afghanistan from the Taliban, we refurbished the, the dam, dragging two turbines 100 kilometers across the desert from Kandahar, installing them in the dam and getting the dam going again. Um, but the Taliban didn't like this. And so ever since, we've been defending the Chikajaki Dam from a forward operating base called Zibrugi, Zibrugi FOB, staffed in 2010 by a group of American Marines. This is a story from the Zibrugi Ford Operating Base. Well, my name is Ryan Yeaton. I'm from Maryland Heights. Born and raised in Missouri. I came out here to fight with the India Battery 3rd Battalion, 12th Marines. Now deployed in Kajaki. It's the Boogie FOB. This broken little province that I find I'm fighting for sends more opium than Burma to the ports of Baltimore. And the Taliban and drug lords keep the place a goddamn mess. Though I swear I am a fighter, right now I'm Confess that I've had enough, I can't take it anymore. Right now, I just want to be home far away from this forsaken war, not fighting from the rookie of our And it's here we take our stand to defend the plant and turbine from an angry Taliban. But if we stay inside the fob, we become a sitting duck. So we get out on patrol and trust our metal and our luck. I got a sweet little daughter to a woman that I love. When they killed Francisco Jackson with another IED, we sent his body back to Dover in the sacrificial flame. Man, I loved him as a brother. Now I'm fighting in his name, and so and I've had enough. I can't take anymore. And home is where I want to be. I go clean my weapon. 